Hey, thank you so much for having me uh, at the next Move event. I really appreciate the opportunity to tell my story. And I'm so appreciative of the fact that you guys have been so incredibly flexible to open up your definition of equality uh, to allow me to actually tell my story. So my name is Michelle Gulovich and I run a couple of businesses. One is called Gorgeous Jewellery Limited and then I have an alternative brand called Dark Angel Jewellery. But my real passion is Network NZ and that's a platform for, for small business owners uh, to connect and network and learn and grow their businesses. So life before ME was quote unquote normal. And when I say that, what I mean is I had a great job. I had like this amazing career path. Uh, I was able to go to the gym. I could go to parties. I could go shopping. I could do all of the normal things that, you know, probably you can do in your day to day life. And um, everything was amazing. Yeah, it was really, really good. The diagnosis was actually extremely painful and took about five months. So what happened is I developed a viral infection and then went into what they call post-viral fatigue. And not knowing what was going on, I actually felt like I was dying. So I ended up seeing, I actually lost track, but probably about six or seven doctors. And each doctor was running blood tests. They were all coming back normal. And I was being offered antidepressants, you know, left, right and centre. And, the, you know, the real struggle for me was that, yes, I was depressed because I was physically incapable of walking. I couldn't drive. I couldn't work. So by the time I got diagnosed, I was actually starting to recover. And the diagnosis, although it was really great to get that sort of confirmation that it wasn't in my head and that I wasn't making it up and that, yes, I had a real thing, I didn't understand the magnitude of it. So at the time, I was like, oh, okay, so you've got this thing called ME or chronic fatigue syndrome, but I didn't know what that meant. And I certainly didn't realize that it would be something that would be with me possibly for life or that it would come back and that it could actually be much worse than what I had already experienced because, you know, at the time, it was the worst thing I'd experienced ever. Yeah. ME has had probably one of the biggest impacts on my life. So massive, in fact, that uh, it's one of my defining moments. So when people ask me about my life before ME, I actually divide it up. So I have pre-ME and then I have post-ME. And like a lot of ME sufferers, I can actually pinpoint um, the exact day that I got sick. So I was fine, I was healthy, I had a viral infection and I've never been the same since. I guess like, you know, when you're talking about ME and the effect that it's had, it would be so easy to focus on the negative. And, you know, there has been heaps of negative and I will touch on that. But what I would like to do first of all is to actually talk about the positive. So one of the really positive things to come out of having a chronic illness or having an invisible illness is that, um, and this is going to sound really cheesy, but it has actually made me a better person. So I have a lot more compassion. And I, I feel embarrassed, actually, when I think about, you know, some of my personality traits and who I was before I got sick. So if I was walking down the street and I saw someone in a wheelchair, I probably did not give that person much thought or consideration. Whereas now, even though I can only walk for maybe five minutes on some days or stand for just a few minutes, if I see someone in a wheelchair, the very first thing that I think is, you know, I'm so grateful that I can actually still walk and I can get about. Um, I do need a mobility scooter to walk the dog, <laughs> but you know, that's cool. I'm okay with that. Okay, some of the, the not so great stuff. Okay, let's look at it that way. So there's a lot of loss and a lot of, a lot of grief that goes with um, such a, a devastating diagnosis. So. Aside from the fact that, you know, your whole life has changed, so you lose your career, you are stuck at home, you can't get out, you can't do any of the things that you're used to doing. And for me, that included, you know, not just work, visiting my friends, going to parties, going shopping, exercising, you know, exercise used to be a huge part of my life. I used to love walking, going to the gym, going running, so all of that was taken away. So not only 
is all of that taken away but on top of that you feel so sick you know at a cellular level that you feel like you're dying so every part of my body hurt it was in pain and on top of that I had to deal with um, people who didn't believe that I was I was sick or that they thought I had some kind of psychological illness and you know that's actually disrespectful to people who do have psychological conditions because those are real things that need treatment but to be told that it was all in my head or to hear you know from other people that you know certain friends were saying things about me behind my back that you know oh yeah Michelle's depressed or you know she just needs to get out and exercise which you know anyone who actually knows me well knows that that's you know one of the number one things that I used to love doing so you know I lost friends, I lost my career, I lost my confidence. Um, yeah, there's been a lot of grief. And the other thing that, you know, that happened for me is what I realized is that my, my whole identity, like who I thought I was, my, my self-definition was all tied up in what I did. So my career, all the things that I did, you know, that is how I defined myself. So when all of that was taken away, what was left was, who am I? So um, I refer to it as my existential crisis. <laughs> and that's probably the best way to describe it. Because, you know, the sort of questions that I was asking myself was, okay, if I can't work, if I can't provide an income, if I can't do all of the things that I'm used to doing, you know, who, not only who am I, but what value do I have as a person? And it was extremely confronting. So that was, yeah, a big, big challenge for me. So part of the work for me around this, you know, what I call my existential crisis is that I actually needed to examine my own self-beliefs about what it meant. And, you know, what I would say is that acceptance is a process, it's not an event. So it took some time and uh, I had to get to a place where I, I believed that I was worthy that I was enough and to tie in with your theme that I was equal and I I'll be honest it's still something that I have to work on every day because I'm constantly confronted you know by others who believe that those things are not true so it's it's an ongoing process uh, a work in process Overcoming challenges has been huge and what I would like to do is to just sort of split that off into two areas so there's self and then there's others so self I've already touched on, which is a huge one, which is your own beliefs about who you are, your identity and your value and your place in this world. So for anybody who's watching this who is suffering from an invisible illness or some kind of disability, my, my hope for you is that you can examine those beliefs and get to a place where you, you believe, you know, in your heart that you are worthy and that you are enough and that you are equal. So that, again, is an ongoing process and something that I continue to work on. Um, what I have found is that, you know, I still grieve the loss of the person that I was. And I've been sick for a long time. So I got diagnosed in 2002 when I was 32. So sh showing my age here. So I'm going to be 46 next month. I've been sick for a long time, almost half my life. Uh, a third of my life. So yes, yeah, self-belief is huge and I encourage you know everybody to work on that. But you know the thing is you can't actually influence the belief of others, their negative beliefs about what it means to be you know someone with an invisible illness until you actually work on on yourself. But when it comes to dealing with others, um, that's a big one too. So what I do is I carry pamphlets around that explain what ME is. So when I park in a disability park, you know, because I can't walk very far, and then I get out of my car, and as you can see, I don't actually look sick. So I have quite often been approached by angry people, you know, abusing me and saying, you know, that I can't park in that spot. So my response to that is to just very quietly and politely reach into my bag and hand over a pamphlet that explains what ME is. So a big thing for me when it comes to dealing with others and overcoming obstacles is to raise awareness, to educate. And um, this might sound cheesy as well, but I've decided that I want to be an advocate for this, for others. I have a lot of friends who have ME. And every time I do an awareness post, and I do them quite often on my personal profile on Facebook, every time I do one, one of them messages me and says, Michelle, I'm so grateful 
that you are doing these posts because when you write what you write, it feels like you are speaking my words. And I remember the very first time that it happened, I'd done a post on Facebook and it was just to my friends, it wasn't a public post. And a couple of people messaged me and said, I'd really like to share that. So I thought, oh, that's interesting. So I could, I could actually have like a positive influence here. So I made the post public and people started sharing it. And then in future, I started making my, what I call my awareness posts, I started making them public as well, and more people started sharing it. So although it does make me feel vulnerable because, you know, there is the risk of being judged by people who, who find out that I have an invisible illness, I've decided that it's worth the risk. Uh, the question that I have asked myself that, you know, if it's not me who's going to help raise awareness, then who? So I've decided to take that on. So when it comes to overcoming some of the challenges that I face with ME, what I found is that I've had to be really creative. So the reality is, is that my brain is different to what it used to be. And just to give you an example, if you imagine a spectrum and on one end you've got somebody in a coma, so their brain activity is, you know, zero. And then at the other end you've got somebody who's having a seizure, so their brain activity is like off the chart. And then in the middle, you would have like your neurotypical person who just has like a normal amount of brain activity, probably, you know, someone like yourself. And then you have someone like me and my brain activity is up towards the seizure end. So although I don't have seizures, thankfully, I do have to take epilepsy medication. And what that does is it dampens down the signals because my central nervous system is basically haywire and it's sending all these random uh, amplified pain signals to various parts of my body where there's a absolutely no tissue injury at all. So because my brain works differently I've had to be very creative with how I work. Uh, I've developed what I call the Michelle post-it system. So uh, I generally carry packets of post-its everywhere. They're all over my table, they're usually on my desk. Every time I think of something, I write it on a post-it and I stick it on my laptop. And so sometimes I go to look at my laptop and it's like five, five rows deep with all these different colored post-its. And then I just grab them all and then I'm able to organize those into lists and you know a project plan or action. Uh, and, and again, when it comes to overcoming the challenges that I face, I am so grateful that I'm in an age of technology where I have access to you know online tools and social media. So what's happened is in spite of having ME, I am actually able to contribute in a meaningful way using these tools. And you know we've now, got you know over 2,000 members in this in this community and you know I wouldn't be able to do that without access to these tools. So something else that I've had to do to to overcome the challenges I face, I had to really examine my self-beliefs and one thing that I have resisted for years was a mobility scooter and I'll be honest I had certain ideas and perceptions about people who used mobility scooters and I did not want to be seen as someone who needed one then we got our dog and our dog is amazing and I love him and what was happening is my husband was taking him for walks and I was missing out on that and it was something that I wanted to be a part of so one day I just went you know what I'm over it I'm doing it bought a scooter that weekend and now I get to go on walks uh, with our dog and um, I'm just so grateful that I was able to do that. Evening the playing field for people with invisible illnesses, what it really takes is for people who are not sick to think outside the box. So someone like me, you know, we have a lot to offer. I have a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge and a lot of skills. And a perfect example of thinking outside the box is the fact that you, have made the decision to come to my house today to talk to me and learn about my story. And that does make me a little bit emotional because I appreciate it so much because actually it would have been so easy for you to actually say, you know what, this is too hard. We've got to go to her house. We've got to take a camera. We've got to record it. We've got to edit it. Let's just find someone else. But you didn't, you, you know, you thought outside the box. You, you made allowances for the fact that I have ME and that we would have to conduct this in a slightly different way and you know that's, that's amazing so thank you so much. So my, I guess my final thoughts to wrap everything up, uh, equality and invisible illness, my hope is that people like me are not seen as less than and 
I realise that that's got a lot of work. There's a lot of work to be done there. But that is my hope, that people like me are not seen as less than. We have so much to offer. We can work online. We can do things like graphic design, website development, virtual assistance. There's so much we can do and so much we can offer. We just need the opportunity and to be given that chance. Um, I guess the other thing, just to wrap up when it comes to you know invisible illness and equality, is that I really invite anyone who is suffering from invisible illness to examine your own self-beliefs about who you are and what your value is in this world because, and I mean this from my heart, you have as much value as the next person. So if you can't work, if you cannot contribute in the way that you used to be able to, it doesn't make you less of a person and you have just as much right as the next person who might be earning a six-figure salary, climbing mountains, raising a family. We are all equal and you know that's just so important to me. So my final thoughts, uh, and this is to people who don't suffer from invisible illness. If someone decides to share this with you, that takes great courage. And so what I ask of you is that you listen and not judge them and just be there for them. And if you don't know what to say, it's actually okay to just say that. Just say, I really don't know what to say. And then offer your help, because sometimes there are people who are much sicker than me. So I'm very fortunate in that I have had a degree of recovery that does allow me to run my own business. But there are some people with ME who are on feeding tubes who need care 24 seven. And so um, there's a huge variance there. So some people may need assistance with things like housework, which is getting their groceries done. And you know, the, the final thing I would say is don't disappear. So just because somebody can't attend a birthday party or you know, go to the movies, they're still there, they're at home, they're trying to live their life as best as they can. So please try and stay in touch with them. Uh, it's not easy being friends with someone like me because if you want to spend time with me, chances are that you will need to come to my house and that does take a special sort of person. So I'd just like to say thank you so much for the opportunity to share my story and I really appreciate that you made the effort to come to my house to do that. And everybody who's at MOVE tonight, I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening and thank you so much for listening.